other folks that taught at, at St. Thomas More High School, and so I got to know uh, him a little bit, like he said, from afar, and then as he went to seminary and came out as a, a Catholic priest, we got to be much closer uh, partnering in ministry for different things over the years, and then developing that friendship still around around fishing and hunting. So, uh, good to be with y'all this morning. I'm happy to happy to be here. I am uh, from Abbeville, went to uh, remain Catholic, and then off to LSU, and uh, back back home to uh, to Abbeville and Lafayette for for years. My wife and I, uh, after we got married, moved to Denver for two years. I did youth ministry in a big church there. And uh, that was a pretty awesome experience. Our, our oldest, our firstborn, was born there in Colorado, in Littleton. And we were in uh, Littleton about two years after the shootings in Col- at Columbine, which I don't know if some of you guys will remember, the Columbine High School shootings were like the first, that was like the first big school shooting in, in, in America, you know, in the rock, rock the country. And that, that community was, uh, was pretty, you know, pretty devastated by that. And I was hired as a youth minister in that church about, like, like I said, two years after. And uh, it was pretty crazy to be in that in that community to try to help with the healing process, to work with the high school kids. A lot of the kids in my youth group like had gone to Columbine High School. And uh, it, was, it was just incredible to, uh, to try to see that, that community kind of rise up out of that tragedy. Um, one thing that I did notice there was in that church parish where I was was the involvement of the parents uh, in their in their relationships with with their their kids, um, the relationship with the parents and the kids' education in the faith. It was pretty it was pretty eye opening because it was so different from what I grew up with, what I understood when I you know came up in Abbeville. We did the same thing. Every, you know, I guess that was always done. We had catechism. We had, you know, little small groups, and we sat in Bible studies, and uh, there was a parent or somebody teaching us. Uh, as I got into middle school and high school, then we had youth group, and uh, but but my parents weren't, you know, they were they would drop me off and pick me up, they would encourage me and support me, but they weren't necessarily involved. Now I'm also uh, a product of my family. I'm very blessed to have had very faithful parents. My parents were. Faithful Catholics. They, uh, my mom's from Abbeville, my dad's from Morgan City. Uh, my dad was a football coach, wound up in Abbeville coaching at DC. Met my mom. They wound up staying in Abbeville and raising their family there. And so, uh, but they were both sort of punch of the clock Catholics. Does that make sense? They were, they were, they were doing their duty, showing up on Sunday, kind of punch of the clock, so to speak. They sit there for their hour sing the hymns, respond to mass, and then go home. And the rest of their week wasn't necessarily anything faith-oriented or faith-filled until uh, my mom and dad attended a retreat in the 70s, in the late 70s, and uh, they just got popped by the Holy Spirit and just caught on fire with their faith. You know, I, I was one, my older sister was two, uh, my parents were going to have three more, so I'm one of five. And uh, right around the time I turned one year old, my dad and my mom prayed uh, and sort of took the gospel seriously. Like when Jesus told in Luke chapter 9, I'm going to read it to you in a second, my mom and dad sort of took Luke chapter 9 seriously. And my mom and dad sold everything, they sold their house and their vehicles. They took me and my sister and moved into an old rectory in Abbeville where Our Lady of Lewis Church had burned down in Abbeville, right behind J.H. Williams Middle School. There was a Catholic church there, not St. Teresa, it was more in the neighborhood. And Our Lady of Lewis caught fire in 1969 and burned down, and the, and the diocese uh, turned the property over to St. Mary Magdalene Church. Well, Our Lady of Lewis was never rebuilt, but the school that was there stayed, and of course the old rectory was there. It was not hurt by the fire. <laughs> so my mom and dad, at the invitation of Monsignor Richard Mouton, who was the pastor at St. Mary at the time, they sold, they sold everything, moved into that old rectory with my sister and I, 
and opened up the Christian Service Center and started to like serve the poor with like soup kitchen, food pantry, clothes, like taking donations and just trying to help help the poor. And in the meantime, starting up Bible studies and starting up prayer meetings and prayer groups. So my childhood was watching my mom and dad serve the poor and lead prayer meetings. It wasn't a normal, <laughs> it wasn't a normal childhood. No, I, I, I liked it. I loved God. I, I don't remember not knowing God. I don't remember not loving God. I don't remember my family not praying together. I don't remember, like, all of my memories as a kid growing up was my family praying together, my family praying with other families, me and my siblings running around with kids, <coughs> excuse me, kids our age, while my mom and dad had prayer groups or Bible studies and things like that. And we would be, you know, certainly being friends with the, with the other kids. And it was an incredible childhood. You know, we were always going to somebody's house. We were always eating great food. We were always sharing. My parents always seemed to be in a good mood when they were around all these friends who loved God. And it was a great witness for us as kids. Uh, I got to school and I didn't realize that not everybody was like that. <laughs> Excuse me. And all of a sudden, I kind of got hit in the face with the teasing and the peer pressure and the and the ugliness that could come in grade school. Like my family was kind of the Jesus freak family. Like we were the holy rollies. And uh, I wore a crucifix to school, you know? Even though I went to a Christian school, a Catholic school, you would think that would be okay. But, you know, my siblings and I got teased. You know, my dad worked for the church and my mom stayed home, so we didn't have a ton of money. So I didn't have the, you know, I'm going to date myself and kind of like all chuckle, but we, I didn't have any Jabo jeans. I didn't have any, uh, Air Jordans, you know, I didn't have like the 80s, you gotta love the 80s. I didn't <laughs> my sister's bangs, my god, we'll talk about that later. But uh, I didn't I didn't have those things, you know. We wore we wore clothes that my dad got at the Christmas Summer Center, you know. And uh, and so all of a sudden this faith that was such a beautiful and positive thing as a small kid. And my parents witnessed, I mean, I, didn't, I wanted to be like my dad and his friends. I wanted to be that courageous and that bold. They, they talked about God like, I, like we talked about hunting and fishing. They talked about God like we talked about LSU football. It was like they weren't afraid. It was very inspiring for me as a young boy, watching my family, and especially my dad, be the leader uh, in faith in our community. You know, it, it, it left a tremendous mark on me. Like, you know, here I am doing ministry. I know in large, large part because of my father. So I, uh, I share a little bit of this testimony because I want to I wanna exhort you guys and encourage you guys as parents and tell you how important, how critical it is that you take the lead with your, with your kiddos in faith. Uh, some, of the tests, some of the little funny stories I have, like I remember, you know, when one of my siblings would get sick, we might have a little fever or something, or the flu or whatever. Like we would lay hands on my, <laughs> we would lay hands on my siblings. Like we would pray over them for, the, for God to heal them, and ask God to heal them. And then of course they go to the pediatrician or take the Tylenol or whatever. But we would pray first. We would always pray first. If somebody fell and cut their knee, like we would we'd pray over it, then we put them in there, right? And so it was definitely not normal. You know, and I learned that as I got into school. Started to get teased, started to kind of get bullied a little bit. I didn't grow until middle school. <laughs> I was a late one when I say, so I got pushed around a little bit. Uh, I didn't like to fight. I'm kind of a, you know, the old saying, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I love people. I, I, I love having friends. I love being part of those people, part of friendships. I didn't want to fight. Yet I didn't like it picked on, especially not for my faith, you know, and not, I certainly didn't like my dad getting teased because he was so holy, you know, so I, you know, I did at times fight and get in trouble in school and started to realize like my dad's faith and my mom's faith that I admired so much as a kid, it was like starting to cost me socially, this is kind of starting to cost me, right, and me trying to be faithful like them was costing me. I wasn't popular, I wasn't cool, and now I'm like, I'm fighting, and I don't like to fight, and I'm... so I started to kind of waffle, and as I got into middle school, I started to try to play the acceptance game, I wanted to get accepted, I, I was going to be like them, I wasn't going to be holy, holy John, I was going to be, you know, cool John, 
Well, Cool John was, I didn't, I didn't know how to be cool. My family wasn't, like, I didn't, I wasn't up on contemporary music. I didn't, my parents didn't let us watch movies that, you know, I didn't, my friends are all talking about Gremlins, and I didn't, I never saw Gremlins, you know, like, or, but I don't know what the movies were. Smokey and the Bandit, you know, I surely didn't watch Smokey and the Bandit as a kid. I've seen it since, it's hilarious. Don't let your kids watch that. But, <laughs> <laughs> I spoke in a bandit as a kid, you know? Uh, so I was never up. I was never like, I couldn't catch up. I couldn't be up with the, when they were talking about things, you know? The one thing that I could probably hold my own with was always like hunting fishing or LSU football or something like that, you know, that my, my dad did do, did, you know, do with me and my brother and, uh, and my younger siblings. Well, I, I would tell you in middle school, um, I certainly took a turn, like a nosedive, in my in my like faith journey. At 14 years old, 13, 14 years old, I could not stand not being cool, not being accepted. So I started to try to, you know, be like everybody else. And what wound up happening was, for me, not measuring up. You know, it, it wasn't okay to not measure up. For a, a young boy, or at least an adolescent boy, it's not okay to not measure up. Well, there's only one of a few things you can do if you feel like you don't measure up. If you're an introvert, you can just hide. Stay out of the way, nobody will figure you out. That you're not adequate, right? You just stay out of the way. Well, I'm not an introvert. That didn't work for me. I'm a people person, right? Or you could be a rage monster. Every time somebody crosses you, just fight, just rage out, and nobody will mess with you. Well, I'm too tender-hearted and kind and like a loving person. I didn't want to be a rage monster. And so where I sort of slid into was the liar. The liar. I wasn't a gossip. So like when I tell you guys I was a liar, I didn't I didn't lie about you. I didn't lie about my people. I embellished me. Does that make sense? I, I lied about me. I like if I went hunting and shot two ducks and told everybody I lived it out. If I caught a fish that big, it was this big. If I could bench press 100 pounds, I could bench press 150 pounds. Like I was always lying and stretching the truth and embellishing me to everybody. And here's a little problem with lying. You know, if I ever remember what you told people. And so you get crossed up. It's not good to be a liar. Right? So my dad certainly taught me not to be a liar. But the pressure to fit overwhelmed and I had to lie to fit because I felt like I did. All the while, let me tell you this, all the while, deep in my heart, who I wanted to be was definitely not who I was behaving like. I wanted to be like my dad deep down. I wanted to be like his friends who were freaking rocks in their faith. I wanted to be that courageous. I wanted to actually help my friends know Jesus like I knew Jesus because like my dad knew Jesus. And I did not have the courage to do it. I didn't have the courage. I tried at times, like, so like I'm playing both sides of the fence, you know, like I'm, a, I'm trying to be cool, but I'm trying to be Christian and, and, and faithful, and I'm trying to be a clown, because I, you know, but I'm trying to, and so I'm playing both sides of this thing, and it was miserable. I hated myself. Most, most in my head, I thought everybody hated me, because I was just a, a, a waif of a person. All the while, my dad kept encouraging me. Encouraging me. My dad kept correcting me. My dad kept teaching me. My dad kept trying to pour courage into me. He kept trying to tell me, "You got to hold your ground, John. You got to hold your ground. If you, get, you know, if you put somebody else down or if you do this, you lose ground. You got to hold your ground. You got to stand for Christ." And God, I wanted that. I hear, I heard his words. I heard his words. I could see how he was living. I wanted it so bad. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I didn't have the courage. There's a there's a little gift. We talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit at confirmation. And you guys will recognize them as a rabble of all because you studied them too when you made your confirmation, right? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, piety, fortitude, fortitude. Fear of the Lord. Understanding, I guess. But that that gift from the Holy Spirit of fortitude, you know what that is? Inner strength and courage. It's a supernatural grace from the Holy Spirit that gives you inner strength and courage. 
to be who we were baptized to be. Sons and daughters of God. So, consequently, my junior year in high school, I'll tell you, high school got a little better. I grew up a little bit, matured a little bit. Everybody matured a little bit. I didn't get teased and picked on as much. I also grew. <laughs> so nobody teased me as much. But I still wasn't like a rock in my faith. I remember freshman, sophomore year feeling better about myself, feeling better about my relationship with my classmates. All the while I kept going home to like my mom and dad getting similar hits and pressure from people in our community just not understanding why we were living the way we were living and watching my dad like hold his ground. Not be ugly. My dad was he wasn't affrontive to people. He wasn't like all preachy. He just lived it. He just did the right thing. He just raised us in the faith. He, he prayed with people. He wasn't afraid to pray with people. He wasn't afraid to talk about Jesus. I'm not joking. Like, he would talk about Jesus like you and I could go outside and talk about Tilson. It, was, it would roll off his lips. He was not, for, not afraid. I wanted to be like that so bad. Because I did love Jesus. So my junior year in high school, it's early in my junior year in high school, and this is where it all kind of boils to a point. I was sitting in English class and we're discussing the Scarlet Letter. Did y'all ever have to read that? <laughs> Everybody's not here. We had to read that in the 90s. It was, anyway, so the Scarlet Letter was about Hester Prynne, who is this beautiful young maiden in a Puritan village in the Northeast somewhere, New England area, in the early, you know, early part of the United States. And the Puritans were super strict religious, right? Remember, they, they like, everything was super strict. And Hester had to wear a scarlet letter A sewn into the frock of her dress, which stood for adulteress. Like, she had committed adultery and she had to wear this A everywhere she went to tell everybody in the town, in the village, that she had committed adultery. How do we know? She had a little girl and there's no dad, right? So everybody knows she committed adultery. You read a few chapters into the book and you're like, who's the dad? Like, nobody knows who the dad is. And I keep reading through, like, I don't know, I got caught up in this book because I started to get mad. Like, this poor girl, she's actually a really good person trying to raise her daughter. She obviously made a little mistake in passion and, like, fell and got pregnant. But, like, whoever her papa is in the village, like, is an absolute coward and a sellout, like, epic sellout because he is leaving her dangling like a piñata in the village to get beat up with that A on her chest and not saying a word. Well, I don't know if you remember, but you read a little bit further into the deal, and who's the dad? It's the preacher. It's the, like, the preacher. The young, dashing, charming preacher who's super popular and everybody loves him. He's the dad. Like, and I got, like, incense anger. Like, read this book, shaking. This dude is a coward. And I was like, Oh, snaps. I'm that dude. I don't mean I didn't have a child. I have wedlock at 16 years old, but I was the coward. Like, absolutely. Had that been me in that, like, I probably would have hit myself too. In the way that I was living. A complete not who God made me to be, for sure. We're sitting in the class one day, and we're sitting in a circle, and we're discussing the book, and it's my turn to share something. And still waffling in and out of, like, trying to be popular and cool, trying to be a clown, trying to be whatever, and trying to be faithful, I'm still playing both sides of the fence. I thought it would be hilarious and shocking if I cursed, said a curse word in class. So... I did. I dropped a dropped a, a bomb in class. It was like the bad word, like the mother of all of them. And nobody laughed. It wasn't funny. 
was like horrified silence in the class. Everybody's staring at me. And then everybody's got a shocked look on their face like, wait, wait, John? Wait, you said that? Again, right? I'm supposed to be the, the holy kid from the holy family. There's like this horrible silence in class for like what felt like forever. And finally my teacher gets up, a male teacher as fate would have it, God, God was calling me out. He walks over to my little desk, he knocks on my desk three times and asks me, three times on my desk he knocks and asks me two questions and probably changes my life. Incredible Holy Spirit moment. He said, John Listy, you need to decide who you are. He's pointing in my face in front of my class, 20 people in the class, 25 people. We're sitting in a circle, there's nowhere to hide. That's like all eyes on me. John Listy, you need to decide who you are. Are you this awesome kid? this Christian leader that we all love, or are you this phony, this clown? Please pick. Like, just pick one. Quit, quit playing them both. At least we'll know what to expect from you. I think we'll love you either way, but pick one. And then he went and sat back down and continued the class. And I was like, I, I was like an arrow to my heart. I knew exactly which one I wanted. In fact, when he was saying it, John, do you want to be this awesome kid, this Christian leader that we all love? Like, I didn't even recognize that he might be talking about me. I didn't think that of myself. But clearly, that's what they saw in me. They did see something in me that, that was there because of my, my mom and my dad and what they brought me up to and what they poured into me. I couldn't even see it. I didn't have the courage to do it, but somebody else saw it and called me out. I got to practice that afternoon thinking, surely I am going to run till I drop, because I'm sure Mr. I won't say his name, my teacher will have told Coach that I cursed in class, I'm going to run till I drop. He never told Coach. I got home ready for the like, I'm going to get just destroyed. My dad's going to kill me. I'm not even going to have to make it to school tomorrow. Teacher never called home. Mom and dad didn't know. Got to school the next day. Surely the principal's going to call me in his office, and this is where it's going to all unravel. Principal never called me in. Principal didn't know. Teacher never told him, never told a soul. The 20 kids in that classroom and him, that's the only people that knew. A few days later, my guilt kind of got to me, and I told my dad. <laughs> I was probably stupid, but I told my dad what I did. And again, I'm kind of waiting for it. Like, I'm just, I just couldn't. I had to get it off my chest. And my dad just looked at me and he said, well, what did you choose? I said, what? And he said, Mr. Bowden gave you a box and she was like, your teacher gave you two choices. What did you choose? And I was like, oh. I get to choose. Like, for real, this, this is my choice. I get to choose what kind of man I'm going to be. I was like, Dad, did you go through this kind of stuff? Like, you know, you weren't always like waving the Jesus flag. Like, what was your, and I, we, we had a little, we had it out. Like, my dad told me, he's like, no, I was a, I was a turd. Like, grace is why I can do this. Like, the Holy Spirit living in me is why I'm a turd. I was not. I don't want you to go down the road I went down. I want to put in you and pour into you what I've experienced in this life in Christ, which is beyond anything I could have ever experienced. I'm listening to my father, right? Tell me again, like reconvert me. Consequently, this was all just like a few weeks before my confirmation. And I remember walking up the aisle to my confirmation. And I remember thinking, like, you, you need a meeting this time, dude. Like, no lies, no embellishment, no phony, no clown, no, like, and my, my uncle is my sponsor, right? I'm all buttoned up. I got, my, I got my tie on, and I'm walking up to the bishop, and I am praying in my head and in my heart, Jesus, help me. 
please help me mean it. I want to mean it. I want to follow you. Help me. I don't have it. Help me. Bishop anointed me, right? My hands and my forehead. He sealed with the Holy Spirit. No, I call on fire and I. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Some of y'all are like, what? <laughs> no, I mean, my heart caught on fire. I, I, I remember, like, my heart dumping out my chest as I got confirmed and I sat down. And I got up and left that church. And my senior year in high school was like unbelievable. Like when you talk about like stand up, hold your ground, like all the the all the like the faith and the like the life of of, of Christ that I wanted to live, the courage to not just live my faith and be faithful. Not just me be faithful, but like to be able to be courageous enough to like invite other people to talk to people about God like my dad could to like be a leader. Like all of a sudden, that like, this courage was there. Like I wasn't afraid anymore. When people would, and they still did, you know, people that were older than me, people who graduated a year or two before me, who had picked on me when I was younger. They, they kept, they did, you know, I was playing my guitar for school masses and trying to help with retreats and stuff, and, like, it did, I was like, I felt, I was like, felt sorry for them, it didn't bother me anymore, it was like, I would laugh it off, or I would, I would laugh with them, yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm such a freak, <laughs> who knew, you know, like, this, this new courage, like, was there. I didn't think in my senior year of high school and then into college, I didn't, like, register Dude, that came from your confirmation. Like you just received a sacrament that is the whole purpose is to pour into you the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that you can rise up to be the man of God or the one of God you're made to be, you're baptized to be. It seals and completes your baptism. It fills you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that you can live into your purpose as a son or a daughter of God and to either raise up around you, whether it's workplace, your 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 home life, your family. First there, for sure, with your family to raise them up in the faith. Like if nothing else you would do for the kingdom of God, that you would raise your kids in the faith, you have slammed up done in what you were baptized to do. Beyond that is great. Praise God, great. But for sure, raise your kids up to know the name of Jesus to know the power of prayer, to know the love of his mother, to know the mercy of God expressed like visibly, audibly, tangibly, experientially in the church. To know that the graces that we need to be his, we can receive every day in the sacraments. Two of which we can receive every day if we so chose. Reconciliation and, and you. And I started to just chase after the faith, started to read the Bible more, started to learn, started to just dive into it, started doing ministry, started doing youth ministry, started helping out, playing my guitar, helping out with retreats. Next thing you know, I'm leading. Next thing you know, I'm getting paid to do. <laughs> this is cool. My dad uh, passed away January 6th of this year. And, uh, it was a very peaceful passing. He had a three-year fight with dementia and had withered away to almost nothing. I, I mean, I could pick him up with my arms to change the diapers, to roll him over. I could, I could pick him up. My siblings uh, and I are very close. We're, we're a close family. Uh, I love all my, you know, my, my brothers-in-law and sister-in-law. I have three brothers-in-law and a sister-in-law. There's 18 grandkids between my five siblings and I for my mom and dad. And, and I'm, I'm just blessed. Like My siblings and I are close. And, um, I went in, so New Year's Day we were all together. 
my dad passed away on January 6th, so we knew it was getting close, like that end of life breathing. And the nurse, the hospice nurse had told us like it wasn't going to be long. And uh, we got together on New Year's Day, all of us were there, everybody. And uh, I kind of broke away thinking I'm going to go sit in dad's room for a little bit and just sit with him, pray, hold his hand. He didn't know us anymore, but I mean, we knew him. So I go in, and my brother's already in there. My younger brother is two years younger. And my brother's, a, my brother's like bigger than me. He's like 6'3". He's a massive guy. He's, just, he's a contractor. The biggest heart in Vermaine Parish. Like, he's an incredible guy. But he had a hard, he had a hard road. Like, he did the opposite thing I did. I dove for my faith, and he ran. Uh, he rebelled and did a 10-year, 15-year, like, peace out to the church, to my family, to everything. And I tried reaching back out to him while I was in college, and we would still hunt together and hang out and fish and do other things, and I'd always be trying to talk to him about coming back to church. And One day he got ticked at me, and he was like, dude, you need to shut up to me about church or Jesus. Like, do not talk. If you want a friendship with me, if you want to still like have a relationship with me, leave me alone. Do not try to convert me. I was like, okay. I said, I promise. I'm never going to talk to you again about Jesus until you ask me, but one day you're going to ask me. <laughs> and sure enough, several years ago, uh, my brother kind of hit a rock bottom. We had all gone to get pizza one night for my dad's birthday. We leave in and said, hey, would you ride with me in my truck? So I gave my keys to my, my fiance at the time, my wife now. And I rode home with my brother, and he was like, you remember where I love you? <laughs> Remember you told me you would never talked to me about Jesus? I said, I didn't, I haven't. He said, I know. I need to ask you now. And I was like, what? And I mean, he just broke. Like, his life was a mess. Doing it on his own. Like, no God, no nothing. Like, just doing it his way. And it was rock bottom. I'm like, and he's like, what do I do? Like, how do I even climb back out? Will God even forgive me? Is God punishing me? I was like, did you grew up in the same house I did? You know better than that. I said, you want to pray? He said, John, I haven't prayed anymore. I said, I don't care. Do you want to pray? So we sat right here, we pulled his truck over, we sat in the Gulf Coast Bank right by Alites. <laughs> Nine o'clock at night. So me and Jan, and we prayed. I said, repeat after me. Jesus. Jesus. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I believe I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead to save me from my sins. He repeats it. Jesus, help me follow you. I commit my life to follow you again. Pause. There's this long pause. And he says, I commit my life to follow you. So I'm hugging my, my brother, my little big brother, while he sobs in his driver's seat. Fast forward, New Year's Day. We're in my dad's bedroom. I walk in, Dominic's already in there. Big hug, big bear hug. We hug each other, we cry. I cried, he has allergies. It was just like a little, uh, <laughs> I told him I had his back when I tell the story. So he had some allergies and some dust in his eyes. I was crying. <laughs> and we break the hug and Dominic leans over to my dad, who's like vegetative. Like a vegetable, like almost catatonic, like it's just there. He leans over to my dad and in his ear he says, Dad, you can let go, you did it. We all love Jesus. You did it. You can go. He said, All of us, our wives, our kids, we all love Jesus. You did it. I shared that story at my dad's at my dad's funeral in the eulogy, and of course, there's not a dry eye in the church. But I want to I want to jump out of my testimony and into yours. I want to exhort you. I want to encourage you, mom and dad. Like there is nobody, Father Campo, John, me, the best youth minister, like nobody that can impact your kids with regard to their faith 
like you. I don't, you don't have to know what Corey knows, what I know, like we've studied, we've trained, like you don't have to know. You need to know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Like find the nursery rhymes and sing them. Like the story's right there. Jesus, that, that little prayer I prayed with my brother, I believe I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead to save me from my sins and I want to follow you. Like that's what you need to know. And you need to know how to pray with them, in front of them, over them. Like, you don't have to make up the prayer. We're Catholic. Like, there's a lot of prayers. <laughs> Open up your phone and Google. Like, they write all. They so easy, right? Your little act of contrition, or your little guardian angel prayer, or your St. Michael prayer, or pray the rosary. You would think, you would think. Kids be like, oh, the rosary is so long and boring. Y'all, I cannot tell you when I suggest to my kids to all come pile up in me and my wife's bed and pray a rosary, they fight over who leads the decades. Like, they want to pray the rosary. From time to time, one of my kids asks, can we pray a rosary tonight? Or can we pray a decade of the rosary? Like, that's, that's like game changing. And I got five kids too now, so they each get to lead a, a mystery, you know? They, I mean, they, yeah, they each get to lead a decade. If you don't have five kids, it's all right. Double up. Bring the poetry. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. The graces that come from this, right? And you, you, you sit there and, like, I'm telling you, I understand it. The grip, the fear, that little grip of fear, like, I've lived that. Most of my high school life, even at times into adulthood, like a little fear grip, right? When you, if you want to do the faith thing, and you want to do the God thing, and you want to open your mouth and talk about Jesus, whether it's with your kids or somebody else, and that little grip of fear gets you. You know what that fear is afraid of? Your mama, Mother Mary. You pray a Hail Mary right quick, you ask the Holy Spirit to be with you, and then open your mouth. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I don't have to tell you, the Bible's telling you, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 10, I think, if you don't know what to say, say, a, say come Holy Spirit and open your mouth, and the Holy Spirit's going to speak right through you. And I'm going to tell you, you probably have had that experience before. You ever been with a friend or relative or somebody who's going through like an unbelievable time? Like you don't know what to do to help them. You don't even know what to say. You're just there with them. And then you, 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 you kind of dare to risk to help them with some encouraging words. And all of a sudden, this stuff comes out of you. And you're like, I don't even know where that came from. And it's like precisely what they needed to hear. It's like it moves them. That's the Holy Spirit. How many of you are baptized? How many of you are confirmed? He lives in you. There's like, not, not, there's like nothing new you need to do. It's in you. You are. You are who he made you to be. And we working this thing out like, I'm a mess, you're a mess. I don't know you, but I know me. So I know you're a mess, because I'm a mess. But he's working out my mess. He just wants my heart. And he wants your kids' heart. And your kids' hearts are 9,000% more likely to be his heart if you give him your heart and let him know it. Let him know it. Now, what is it, take? to say a little prayer with them before bed. What does it take? It don't. I mean, look, I get it. I got five of them, and it's, a, it's and you're trying to get them to bed, and you're exhausted, and this, the dishes are still piled up right there. And like, right, the dogs haven't even fed yet. Like, good luck, y'all. For real. Go kill a squirrel. Like, I, 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 got, I got no kind of time for y'all. Like, <laughs> I got it. Like, we, it's nuts. But to just walk in that, that, that bedroom with a Hail Mary, an Alpha, a Glory be, an act of contrition, whatever, kiss them on the forehead, make a little sign of the cross on their forehead. 
Yeah, you. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. And your home, that's your home. That's your home. That's your church. And those little ones are your little congregation. Yes, you can bless their foreheads. And yes, you can pray with them. They will never forget it. Maybe even one day, like my brother, at a rock bottom, he's going to reach back up to who? Jesus. Maybe. And let's pray to God that none of your kids, God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that none of these little ones that belong to anyone here today would ever hit a rock bottom. And that they would live into their faith and into their purpose. But even if they did, if you lay a foundation with them in faith, they will never forget it. So the program that Father is launching here, we started at St. Mary Magdalene uh, three years ago. We're in our fourth year, starting our fourth year with family. Uh, we call it Family Faith Sunday, but it's a family catechesis program where mom and dad come just like y'all right here. The kids go off with our team and do little activities and color sheets and get a snack and whatever, you know, like play the guitar for them. They love me. They love me. I'm like a rock star with three-year-olds. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> just checking it out. Oh my God, they're all excited about Jesus. And then mom and dad come into either the church or the hall and get, get, a, get a talk just like this, a testimony or something inspirational. Uh, the program, a lot of Christ, a lot of the, the, the themes each, each month. We've got one month, right, per month. Each month the themes are like lined up where no matter the grade level your kids are, the theme's the same, right? If it's the Trinity or the sacraments, well, everybody's studying sacraments that month. And, well, it might be a little bit more age-appropriate as the grade level gets higher, right? And so the older kids might get a little bit more meat and potatoes than the little kids, but they're all talking about sacraments. So when you do this at home with them, you sit with them, and you pick one time, pick, pick a pick old Sunday afternoon, it's already kind of church day, right? Go to mass, get you some fried chicken, and then sit down and, and talk about this, do your little activities. There's a little prayer exercise with it. You know, you're praying at home with your kids. You're talking about the faith at home with the kids. You're reading little Bible stories at home with the kids. You're getting their input, and then you're getting their feedback. Y'all, since we started this, I'm going to tell you, so three years ago, our second graders coming into First Communion, most of our public school second graders didn't know the sign of the cross, didn't know what the Trinity was, didn't know what the Eucharist was, didn't know, like they just didn't know. And we were doing our little two-week summer program, and we were doing our little, you know, it wasn't sticking. We started family catechesis. I'm not joking, and I am not exaggerating when I tell you our second graders, our public school families, know as much if not more than our than our BC families. Like it's not even close. Like they are exceeding because mom and dad are teaching them at home, and the kids love coming. And the the transformation that we started seeing in the parents is incredible. I had a dad pull me aside. Two weeks ago, we had our little thing like this, two weeks ago, and I had a dad pull, he's a North lady dad, got a big family, pulls me aside, he's like, dude, I'm not this guy. I'm like, what? He said, I'm not this guy. Who, what? He said, bro, I'm, I'm driving in my truck now, I got Lauren Dago on the radio all the time. <laughs> he said, dude, the other day, one of, one of these Christian songs comes on, and Lauren Dago said, I had to pull my truck over because it's something, like, just crying in my truck. I was so moved by God's mercy for me, and God's love for me, and what I'm seeing in my kids. He's like, I'm not that dude. I said, well, evidently you are. You are that dude. What's even more important now is your kids know you're that dude. And your kids are going to grow up to be that dude. So the opportunity for you to grow in your faith, and the opportunity for them to grow in their faith as you guys journey together, is profound and remarkable. When we started the program, I was a little anxious that we were going to lose parents. It was too much to ask. The opposite has happened. Families are coming to St. Mary Magdalene Church and registering because they want this program for themselves and for their kids. Because our families are talking now. They're talking to their, to their sisters and their brothers and their cousins and their neighbors. 
and our programs, like we have 90 something kids right now. It's, it's like, okay, what well, we got to do with 90 kids? Now we have a big old parish, but I want to encourage you guys. I want to affirm Father Corey Campo for moving to this program. I want to encourage you guys, affirm you for being here on a Sunday morning. I know we usually do doing the donut run and whatever, but like, this is important. I'm a, I'm a product of a family that lived out their faith. And I want, just want to encourage you guys to take this seriously, to take the opportunity to do this. Dads, one quick section for you. Uh, I just be, would be remiss. Uh, the statistics are if a family comes to the faith through their kids, like if the kids grow up, experience Jesus, and bring it back to the family, that the retention of faith in that family is like less than 10%. Like people who are going to stay faithful. If faith comes to the family through the mom, the retention of faith in the kids and the whole family is like up to like 50%. If faith comes to the family through the dad leading the way, it's like 87% retention in the faith. I'm not, I don't make this stuff up. I am not a chauvinist or a misogynist. I believe everybody's equal in the sight of God, but I believe we have an important role in our families. And our kids need to see us love Jesus. And if our kids see us love Jesus, they're going to love Jesus. That's just how it is. Amen? Amen. Thank you, John. I'll just give one quick word. I'd give you a blessing, but you can get it in mass. So I'll give you a solemn blessing at the end of there. So one quick word, and then John will tell you about picking up your children or joining them from mass. And, and that's simply that, you know, a lot of thought and prayer went into um, instituting this program, but I want to tell you that the number one thing I was praying for it is for you. You know, like John said, Come on, I wanted that faith, and I want to live it, you know, and now I'm going to share it with others. It was the same thing. I mean, obviously I'm a priest, you know, but I can take that for granted. You know, from the day one that I got in the parish, who I'm praying for is not for me to get a gold star from the mission, I'm praying for you because I want you to know me. And I want you to have that joy. And I want you to be able to share it with your children. And that's what we're here for. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to John and I'm going to remember to get ready for Mass. John number two, we got John Square this week. John, I'm going to thank you, God. Thank you, John. All right, uh, the kids are going to be over in the narthex, you know, the entrance to the church. So, just Go on over there and pick them up or go mass, whatever you're going to do. And uh, we'll hand them off to you safely. Okay? Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.